And at the end of Acts chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 42 through 47. And then we're going to look at a couple other places. So keep your Bible handy. We'll try to have scripture up on the screens for you. It may not be quite as fast and random as it was just a minute ago with David, but uh, I probably won't bounce back quite as much back and forth. But anyway, verse 42, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were being done by the apostles. Verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone who had need. Every day as they continued to meet together in the temple courts, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the church. This is the beginning of the church. If you go back to chapter 2, verse 1, you see when the church sort of began and how it started and everything that's going on. So this is the beginning of the church. We hear about in chapter 2, the coming of the Holy Spirit with fire. And 3,000 people were added on the day of Pentecost. Now remember, the day of Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. Jesus was with the disciples and the apostles for 40 of those 50 days. He met with them. He was with them. He fed them breakfast, as we saw last week at the end of chapter 21. John doesn't have everything in there because remember the very last verse of John's gospel? If we wrote down everything that Jesus did, the world could not contain the volumes because he did so much stuff. That's why you have four gospels and four different accounts with different sightings and different stories because to Mark, as a young lad following Jesus around, he was focused on certain things. Matthew, the scribe, who was a tax collector, Matthew was focused on some other things. He was a little bit more practical in his viewpoint of Jesus as the Messiah coming through the lineage of the tribe of Judah. Luke, on the other hand, was a Greek who was a physician who was helping Paul with his defense for the gospel as he was thrown in jail and having to go stand in front of governors and principalities. And so Luke wrote the gospel of Luke and Acts as a two-volume set to help with Paul's defense before Felix and Festus. So each of the gospels were written for different reasons. And like we've said for the past several weeks, John was written to give God the glory that he deserves through his son, Jesus Christ. And from that aspect of Jesus being not only Messiah, but the Son of God, the one, as John called him a lot. And here we see the one now coming back and uh, starting the church. Remember what he told Peter last week? Peter, I want you to stay in Jerusalem. I want you to take care of my sheep. I want you to feed my little lambs. I want you to care for the flock. Jesus took Peter brought him back from his denial, sanctified him, baptized him by fire. And anybody in ministry can tell you sometimes that's what it feels like. But for the grace of God, by the grace of God, and through the grace of God to become the first pastor of the first church ever in Jerusalem. Peter was set apart to do that. And remember what he said about John, the gospel writer? Don't worry about John. I've got a different task for him to do. John didn't start out as being a pastor. John wrote the gospel. Peter didn't write a gospel. Peter wrote just two little letters, first and second Peter, right? But John wrote the gospel. That was a big undertaking. John wrote first and second and third John, little letters, but yet very powerful. And then he wrote a, a little book in the back. Yeah, 20-something chapters long, and nobody ever pays attention to it. It's just the last book. Nobody runs to the last chapter to read the last thing before they start the novel, right? You don't go to the back and read that one before you start. Some people actually do that, and when they get a novel, they read the end of it. Then they go back and decide if they want to read the rest of it. Like, what? Ruin a good story. Okay? Here's the end of the story, just in case y'all didn't know this. Jesus wins. Amen. Period. 
But here in cha chapter 2, verse 42, it says, they, who are they? The ones who got saved. The ones who got saved and have now been called by God's name, who are they? They are the church. And they devoted themselves. What is devotion, by the way? Is it just, I'll get around to it? Oh, I'll do that when I think about it next time? Or I'll put that on my list somewhere. Do any of you have a bucket list? Is going to church on your bucket list? It should be at the top. Maybe right after seeking God daily. Going to church. Making a difference in the world where God has placed me. They devoted themselves. Disciplined. Right? What is discipline? It's getting up at 7 on Easter Sunday morning. Well, actually, more like 5.30. <laughs> to get there before 7. Because you don't want to miss me. All I get to do is introduce people. So... Please, you know, come for that so you can see me introduce people. So it'd be great. And by the way, that's by choice. <laughs> they worked at it. You know what discipline is? It's work. Discipline doesn't come easy. When's the last time you read your Bible? Okay, no, no. You're not supposed to answer. Right? Do you have a daily habit of reading your word? I have so many Bibles. I have Bibles everywhere. If you go in my office, I can show you Bibles, lots of Bibles, every translation almost that's ever been written except the one that Shuggy has, and I may need to get one of those one of these days because hers has some interesting insights because it's from a Jewish perspective, uh, rewritten you know, through the mindset of what Hal calls a completed Jew. And so um, you know, I don't have that one, but I have a Phillips translation. I have a Williams translation. Ever heard of those? They're good little New Testaments. Those are guys who taught Greek in seminaries, and they decided, since they knew Greek, they should do their own translations. Well, they only did the New Testament because, guess what? The Old Testament wasn't written in Greek, even though it was translated into Greek. All right, I digress a little bit. I have lots of Bibles. You know what I should do? Read them. Study them. Every day. I had to tell my elders at the church in Fayetteville that Lisa and I started back in 1998, pastored it for a little bit over 10 years, and I said to my elders, guys, here's what you need to do. Hold me accountable. Me studying to bring a sermon on Sunday morning is not me doing the work of discipline in my life. I need to be held accountable for daily devotion and, and spiritual reading. And they were like, what? I said, Yes. That's your job as an elder. Hold me accountable. Make sure that I'm spending time with God in prayer. Make sure that I'm reading the word daily, not just getting prepared for a Sunday morning message or Bible study. Make sure I'm doing something for me in my own spiritual life and not just your spiritual life. It took me a while to convince them. And finally, one of them, Brian, a good friend of mine from high school days, finally started asking me, so Don, how are you doing? Brian, I could be doing better. Okay, let's talk about that. Let's, you know. And so Brian was faithful, and some of the others kind of started to catch on a little bit too. Uh, my good friend Larry that we ran off, he moved up to Kansas City to be near grandkids. What's with that? Anyway, they devoted themselves. They made it a priority. And what did they devote themselves to? Well, quite a few things, by the way. The teaching of the scripture that the apostles taught. They couldn't just go out and get their New Testament out. And oh, by the way, I said I have a lot of Bibles. I have Bible apps on my phone. I have the Gideon version that Buck told me about a few years ago. So I have the Gideon Bibles, and it has several different translations. And I have the live church or thing in Edmond, Oklahoma that they've put out. And it's amazing. And it's got all of these translations, and many of them will talk to me. They'll just read the Bible to me. And so sometimes at night when I can't go to sleep, I put on Leviticus on the speaker and just like, good. Hey, the Bible is powerful and effective. And if you all think I make you go to sleep, just study. I mean, just listen to Leviticus late at night. That'll help your insomnia. All right. They devoted themselves to the teaching of Scripture. They didn't have a Bible that they could turn to. They had the apostles. And so the apostles were the ones in the first church with Peter at the head leading that church. They were the ones who were teaching. What were they teaching? The words of Jesus. 
the things that they had heard, the things the Holy Spirit has prompted them to remember to say. Guess what? They hadn't even written the Gospels yet. This is the new church. It had just been started. We're talking 33, 34 AD, somewhere right in there. Right after Jesus ascended, the church started. Why? What happened? The Holy Spirit showed up. And you can't not talk about God when the Holy Spirit's in you. If the Holy Spirit is truly in you, you should be talking about God, about His Son, Jesus Christ, about the Holy Spirit that lives within you, that gives you power every day so that other people will know. That's why we're here. The Great Commission is go and tell. Well, what are we going to tell? What we've already experienced. I tell people all the time, and in classes that I taught, guess what? I would tell them the best thing about knowing God is that when you tell somebody else, it's from your experience. Don't just quote Bible to them. Tell them about what God has done in you through the person of his son and how that experience has changed you. That's what they want to know. Is it real? Will it make a difference in my life? Will it help me? Because everybody these days is me-oriented. They devoted themselves to the teaching of Scripture and to, I like it, every time this appears this way, it's the fellowship. The Greek word for fellowship, Christian fellowship, is koinonia. It is a holy, sacred gathering of saints for lots of purposes. Number one, the gathering together just empowers each other. David was talking about that, the gathering of the saints together to worship and praise God and to remember certain things about Jesus, like his blood, his death, his sacrifice, the atonement for our sin. So the, the Christian bond that we share when we're around other people. I love hanging around believers. I mean, I thrive on it. And then I get tired of people and I have to run away and hide. But I thrive on being around other believers. I will go to a meeting where other believers are. If we're going to sit and talk about Jesus, I mean, if we're going to sit and talk and waste time, forget it. I'll go take a nap or something. But if, we, if I know that we're going to talk about Jesus and his word and, and just encourage one another, man, I am there no matter how tired I am because it, it does something for me. It encourages my soul. It strengthens me. And then they also devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, not eating together necessarily, but the Lord's Supper. Yes, there's also a part of fellowship that means breaking of bread. So it's a twofold thing. They loved getting together as the body of Christ to fellowship. And you can't really be a Christian without fellowshipping over food. It's just written in here, the breaking of bread. That's why we have pot providence every second Sunday. It gives us an excuse to break bread together, to fellowship around tables, and to enjoy each other's company over a little bit of, you know, speckled meatballs, or pot roast, or apple cobbler. I'm making my order now in case y'all aren't paying attention, right? So the fellowship, the breaking of bread together, the Lord's Supper, right? We talked about celebrating that coming up on Easter Sunday. That will be a high spiritual divine time for us on Easter to celebrate the Lord's Supper together and through prayer. Now, did they save prayer for last because it's the thing we don't think about? No, we save it for last because in the ancient world, the last place was the best place. We always start, you know, with, oh, yeah, here's the number one reason. No, no, and we count down from 10 to 1, Right. They put prayer at the list at the bottom because it's the most important. You see, it's an ancient mindset. It's not our mindset all the time because for us, first to be first, and Jesus said the first needs to be last. So why is prayer in the last order? Because it's first. You see, in the mindset of Christ, prayer is the most important thing in the list. Why? We should be praying for other people. We should be praying with other people. We should have their care and concern for us more than anybody else as well. And then 43 makes it clear it's for everybody, for all. Everyone needs to be able to come and be filled with awe. Do you know what awe is? It's the first part of awesome. 
What about ah, all? Where's that word? Because this is what they're talking about. Not awesome. Ah, all. All of them were filled with awe and wonder. Because the apostles not only were just teaching about Jesus, telling them great, cute little stories. They were living out the expectation of what having the Holy Spirit in our lives is all about. It's about the power of God in us. They were all in it together. They were experiencing these things, seeing wonders and miracles with their own eyes. And all of the believers in verse 44 hung out together. Now, for some who quickly come to that and say, well, they, were, they had a, you know, a common thing going on. Well, they weren't in a commune. They didn't sell their houses just to move into neighborhood things so they all could live together in their own little clustered places. You know what a monastery is? Where monks go to hide from the world. I know I'm being harsh, but monks go to hide from the world so they're not tempted by the things of the world, so they can focus only on Scripture, Scripture sola, right? Scriptura sola, right? So that they can just focus on the Word. Well, if they don't go out of their cloistered places into the world to help teach and train those who are lost, guess what? Studying the Scripture means absolutely nothing. You don't draw closer to God by just studying the Word. You draw closer to God by studying the Word through prayer to go out and make a difference in people's lives and in your community. So what were they doing? They were all together hanging out. They had a commonality. There was something uniquely the same about all of them, even though they were so strangely different. And guess what that is? The work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who indwells everybody as a believer when they come to faith in Jesus Christ is the same Holy Spirit from 2,000 years ago. It's the same Holy Spirit from 6,000 years ago that hovered over the earth while it was being created. And so the Spirit of God hovered over the deep. And then when Jesus fashioned man out of the dirt of the ground, it's the same Holy Spirit that breathed life into the nostrils of man to give him the essence of the Father. It's the same Holy Spirit that pushed the rock away and went in to wake up Jesus and put his body and soul back together so that he could come out and resurrect and ascend to the Father. It's the same Holy Spirit that when we invite Jesus as our Lord and Savior into our lives, the Holy Spirit comes. He is the free gift of God that changes us from the inside out. And then it said in verse 45, they would go and they would take their possessions and sell them in order to be able to fund ministry to the poor and needy. And every day they gathered in the temple courts. Where's the temple courts? In Jerusalem. The courts are around the temple. You have different levels of courts, right? You have the outside court, which is the court of Gentiles. You have a court for the Hebrew women. You have a court for the Hebrew men. You have an inner court for just the priests, where the priests can go. And then the inside of the inside of the inside is a place called the Holy of Holies, where only once a year can the high priest go on the day of Yom Kippur, where he goes in to sacrifice and atone for the sins of all the people. And it's that veil, that curtain in front of the Holy of Holies that was torn in two, top to bottom. Scripture is very clear about that. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil was torn in two, giving access, according to the book of Hebrews, for us mere mortals into the presence of God the Father. Through the Son, because of His blood, and by the power of the Holy Spirit living within us. Every day they gathered in the temple courts. They gathered publicly to meet together in a group. And then what happened? Well, they gathered individually in small gatherings and said they went to homes as well. So here's the idea. And years ago, uh, Fellowship Bible Church kind of coined this, began in the late 60s down in Dallas, uh, and they called it Cell Celebration. A cell is a basic unit of a body. We have millions of cells in our body. So the cell is the, the small, independent structure that helps create the whole. And so they would say, we meet together in cell groups. And they coined the phrase cell groups, meaning small group Bible studies, home-based Bible studies, meeting at homes throughout the week, throughout the neighborhood, throughout all of their community, and then they would gather to do celebration. So cell, 
celebration. How do you gather to do celebration? You gather in mass. And when I say that, I don't mean Catholic. I mean together, in unity, all saying the same thing, that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. They met together in public. And what's more public than the temple in Jerusalem? They met, they met in the temple gathering there. And they met in homes. And then they were all together eating with glad and sincere hearts. I like that one. Breaking of the bread again. And verse 47, praise God through worship, enjoying each other, hanging out together, koinonia at its finest, and, notice the big and here, and God added to their number daily those who are being saved. Who's doing the adding? God. Always God. It is not a program or an institution that man has created or invented. It is always God doing the addition. It is God through his son by the power of his spirit doing the adding. On the day of Pentecost, at least 3,000 people. Not all of those were from Jerusalem because there were God-fearing people from all over the world who had come for Passover and the Feast of Weeks. And they were still there on the day of Pentecost celebrating and worshiping because they were God-fearing Jews and other believers in God that were still in Jerusalem. And then when the Holy Spirit fell on those folk and they came out talking in other people's languages so that they could hear the gospel, 3,000 plus. Remember, they counted only the men. So multiply that by at least two and a half times, three or four times. And you've got three to six to 10 to 12,000 people who became believers in Jesus that day. And then after that, after they had gone home, guess what? Multiplication's happening because they're going to Africa and back up north or, you know, where they came from, past Damascus, up, you know, past Tyre and Sidon, up into Asia Minor. And guess what? The word of Jesus Christ is being spread exponentially throughout the known world because they were all there that day. And the Holy Spirit spoke to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's page one, or just the first page. So next week, we're going to do the backside. Which, by the way, if we save the list and we know the prayer comes at the end because it's the beginning, just wait till next week. I got more. So that's awesome. So anyway, I love it when God gives me stuff because he always gives me more than I need. Isn't that the way he is? God always gives us more than we need, and usually without even asking for it. You know, this week I was struggling because, hey, for the last... I don't know, a year and a half or more, we've been doing John. I knew what was coming next. Lisa said to me, what are you doing Sunday? Don't know yet, but you know, God will show me. So I've got the next few weeks all mapped out, so we'll go there. Because, oh yeah, Palm Sunday's coming up really soon. And then we have something else coming up right after that. So Good Friday service on Friday night, Easter Sunday morning, and we'll continue to talk about the good things of Jesus and what he does for us. And by the grace of God, we are his and his alone.